SIG Talks, Episode 008, One Sigafoos at Red Deer and Another in Texas. Hello, and welcome to SIG Talks with your host, Dr. Carrie Sigafoos, your home for the chiropractic philosophy, where we discuss the teachings of Dr. James Sigafoos, from his writings to his talks and his many audio presentations. Today's episode is another special one. Last week we had Patsy. This week I have Chris Burfield from Market with the Heart. Today's clip is from Sigafoos at Red Deer up in Canada. So sit back, take a listen, and I'll see you on the other side. I'd just like to uh, welcome Dr. Sigafoos to Canada. He had a long journey yesterday. He was heading to Banff and then turned around went to Jasper and all the way back here, so he's been on the road. And uh, with no further ado then, just have you come up and give us what you got. Okay. I'll just struggle with this thing. Thank you. I, uh, I've been in the Rockies, but not in the Canadian Rockies, so now I can say that I was there too. We are, this morning, going to cover some things. I would say that I don't plan my talks, so I don't really know what's going on. We have, uh, we have some things that will be under order, but what comes out, I don't really know, because I never never write them up and I don't think about them. They just come as, as it comes along. I would say that uh, there will be some things, I don't know if I'll say anything that's gonna disturb you or not. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. If I do, experience it. If, uh, if I don't, that's fine. But uh, oftentimes we find that people, when, uh, when we get on their particular case, that is to say if I'm directing something at somebody who doesn't want to be directed to, he or she normally goes to the bathroom. So when we see you uh, getting up and going out, we know what's going on, you see? And uh, I think that's a carryover from uh, childhood that whenever things get rough, you know how you always said, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom, mommy or daddy, and they caught you in the cookies or whatever. And, and I think we still do that. So uh, apparently I know that there's people that I've talked to that I've seen in a crowd over and over and over again who have bladders more than likely about this size because <laughs> They're in and out constantly. So uh, I'm not going to say anything that, that uh, isn't validated or provable, and I'm uh, certainly not going to say anything that's outside of chiropractic because that's me. I, to give you a history of me briefly, I graduated from National in 59. I really had no concept. I um, had a, a good education, but I had no concept of chiropractic. I really didn't know the philosophy. I didn't know anything about what chiropractic was for. I was taught that chiropractic, the adjustment is to inhibit or stimulate the nerve, which is exactly what drugs do. So in essence, I was in my own mind practicing drugs. I had no concept of the reasons for making an adjustment. I had no concept for the reasons. I knew how, I thought, but not a specific adjustment. I used a lot of osteopathic moves that we were taught and I certainly, uh, as far as the science of chiropractic per se, I really didn't know that either. I was taught uh, gastric lavage for my chiropractic principles, how to do a gastric lavage out of Meekin's practice of medicine, which really didn't have a great deal to do with chiropractic. Because all the years I've been in practice, I've never done one. Hopefully I never do. But I think that maybe we should take off from chiropractic, uh, from the history. Historically, we have some spots in our, in our being, in our profession that we don't understand, that we don't know anything about. We don't know where we're coming from. So I think it would be nice if all of us knew where chiropractic came from and we had some understanding. I will tell you this, in 1938, I'm going to go back from there, but in 1938, there's some people here that may have been uh, aware of, there used to be a, a brochure that went out called Burton Shields. And in 1938, there were 22 chiropractic hospitals throughout the United States. 
At present, there's one. And that one had to struggle very hard to, to, uh, to be in existence. That happens to be Kale's Chiropractic Hospital in Spartansburg, South Carolina. But there were quite a few of them. There's one in Pittsburgh, there was one over in Philadelphia, there was one in Davenport. Actually, BJ had one in Davenport that was for mental cases. He had uh, nothing but mental cases. And it ended up that uh, they found in 1938 in their research that chiropractic got two and one half times the results in mental problems as did medicine. And that was only out of one hospital. So we have a need for our chiropractic hospitals throughout the country, but a lot of our, in, in the United States in particular, they've legislated us out of that. It's in the legislature that we can't do it, that we would have to do so many things that we can't do that it's impossible to create. I don't know how it is up here. I know that you have controls up here as well, but it would be nice for us to have some chiropractic hospitals. I might add that we wouldn't have those chiropractic hospitals for the norm that people go into hospitals for. They would be going in for chiropractic care, not first aid care or medical care. But we'll get into that in a little bit. Let's go back previous to eight years previous to 1895. And at this time, D.D. Palmer, who was the founder of chiropractic, was a magnetic healer. Now, magnetic healing is a it's still in, uh, it's not in vogue today, but it was a great deal at that time, and there are people today that are doing it. And magnetic healing deals with one having a positive and a negative hand. So you place a positive hand in front and a negative hand behind, and you put the positive hand over the organ of involvement, and you hold it there for 10 or 15 minutes, purpose being that, that your energy is supposed to re-energize the organ that is deficient in that individual. Now, D.D. did that for about eight years. Along the same time, he was a great student in metaphysics. And he was studying, making a study of, 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 uh, of metaphysics. So, eight years he went along with this, and he started to realize, and he started to think about something. He said, you know, there, why is it that one organ is involved and not the rest? Why would I be just working with one organ? What is it that actually is allowing these people uh, the a healing if in fact it takes place where does healing come from where does sickness come from where in fact does health come from where do i come from what's running this body what made it where's it coming from what's going on he started to question these things and he began to investigate it now he previously was a teacher he had been a school teacher in in, in iowa and he was in uh, one school or one what do you call it one room schoolhouses and where he took care of of one through ten grades at that time. He was a brilliant man, no doubt about that. He came to the conclusion one day that, that, that there's something in the body that runs and regulates the body. He, he decided that it was something not physical. He decided that it was something that was more than physical, that it was something metaphysical, that there was something in there that he didn't quite understand. He also realized then that there were lumps on the spine. As he investigated the spine, he found lumps on them. And he got to thinking that if there are lumps in the spine, maybe those lumps are doing something to these people. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So he looked at his first person when he decided to do something about the lumps. That first person was a black man, as the story goes. And his, the black man's daughter, as a matter of fact, goes around and tells this story. She's still living. He laid him, Harvey Lillard, on the table, and he found this lump on his spine, and he pressed on it. Now, he brought him back three days in a row, and that was before Jim Parker, or Singer, or any of these fellows. <laughs> and so three days in a row he came in, and he reduced this lump. And when he reduced the lump sufficiently, Harvey regained his hearing. So Dee Dee jumped up and down, and he ran all around town, and he said, I found the cause of deafness. Bring all the deaf people in. So the deaf people started coming in from all over town. And the second woman was deaf, stone deaf. And after he reduced the lump on her spine, she was still stone deaf. And he reduced it again and again and again, and she was still stone deaf. However, her heart disease cleared up. 
And he said, what the heck is this? I, I push on one lump and, I, and the hearing comes back. I push on another lump and her heart comes back. And what, what do we have here? Jeez, I don't know. Let's, let's look at it. So he started bringing people in all for the same purpose, still hearing, but hearts were clearing up, skins were clearing up, eyes were clearing up, and a variety of diseases in the body were clearing up. And he said, I don't understand this thing, but I know one thing, that pushing on bumps isn't just for deaf ears. I mean, I know that the body's healing up, so we've got maybe some bumpitis here or something. <laughs> so he started going through these people, and there was a magnitude of people, you see, because in those days, when you did good works, people came. And the interesting thing is, and I need a blackboard before I forget it, sometime, but the interesting thing is that people, now listen, I want you to talk, I go all over this country talking philosophy. I'm on televisions, I'm on radios, I'm in colleges, I'm everywhere that people will listen. They didn't used to listen. It's only recently that I got in. Only recently, in the last 20 years, have I been going into the mainline chiropractic colleges, such as, just spoke at Palmer, was at Logan, going to Cleveland, and so on. I could only get into certain schools, certain areas, certain closets, certain people, certain clusters that maintained the idea that they were going to continue to talk and preach the principle and the philosophy of chiropractic. But it seems as though that the philosophy of chiropractic now is, is becoming more important to our profession and that we're getting into more and more and more areas. But going back to this thing, D.D. didn't understand what was going on in these bodies, but he did understand that people were coming in from all over creation. So he had to expand, and he, he took on more and more rooms. He was on 2nd Street there in Davenport, upstairs. And as he took on more rooms, he ended up with a small hospital. And he was bringing people in and keeping them. That got to where it was spilling out. And he went down and he got himself a rock house on Rock Island Road in Davenport. And he started to fill that up. Now, that held about 23 to 32 people. And those people would come in and they'd spend anywhere from one to two weeks. And the main of the people coming in were non-ambulatory, meaning that they couldn't walk for one reason or another. And it wasn't because they had one of the 13 danger signs. It was because they were sick. I don't know if you all have danger signs up here, but in, a, in the States, everything I look at in the yellow pages is danger signs. You know, now they, instead of, they just number you. You've got number one, you've got number three. But there was none of this danger sign business. It was people coming in that were non-ambulatory because they had degenerative diseases. Diseases such as cancer, diseases such as lung disease, joint disease, a variety of degenerative diseases, meaning that the body was in a state of death and they could no longer walk. So they carried these people in, they brought them in by carriage, and they came in on a train, and Davenport started a hum with this man down here that was some kind of healer. And the interesting thing was that people came in that were non-ambulatory, the main of those people walked out in two weeks. He had a woman come in and she was there for about two to three weeks. She finally responded she couldn't move when she first came in. She stayed with D.D. for 17 months. She was the first C.A. She volunteered to stay there and work with him because she had recovered from cancer sufficiently to be able to work 12 to 16 hours a day assisting him and taking care of other sick people. At the end of 17 months, she passed on. The point is that she did respond well enough to work in that manner for another almost a year and a half, or better than a year and a half. Now, People were coming in with blind eyes, deaf ears, all kinds of diseases, whatever disease that your mind right now can create in its little head, that's what came in there. And they were responding. And they were responding to chiropractic that was not yet a science and not yet an art, and not yet a philosophy for that matter. But it was responding to a man who had a vision that said that if there is something, if there's a bone out of alignment, and finally he, he, he discussed with himself and with other people, could there be a bone out of alignment that's interfering with the life force in this body? And if the life force is involved in this body and a bone is stopping it by me moving the bone, it's allowing expression of the life force once again so that the body can heal itself. And these were the concepts that he had going through his mind. And ultimately, they named this, a preacher named this, chiropractic, from the Greek word, hands only, or by hands. <coughs> One reverend weed. And so chiropractic continued to grow 
up until the time that about 1906, about 1906, BJ started to play an important role because at that time, D.D. had gone. D.D. was under a lot of pressure. He had gone to jail for practicing chiropractic. He was under a great deal of pressure. He was under a lot of financial pressure, under a lot of various pressures. So he just took off and he left. And he left B.J. there with all of these, this building and these people and these debts. Now, B.J. decided at the age of 18 that he wasn't going to allow this thing to sink, that he was going to hold the line. Didn't know how, but he was going to do it. And so he did. And after he got the school to recover and he came back financially, D.D. came back. And, and he greeted D.D. with open arms, and they worked together again for about a year till D.D. started causing the institution to go into failure again, monetarily. And he left, he left again. And B.J. continued on. And, and built his school and started teaching and started researching and started writing a book. Now, D.D. wrote a book in 1906. B.J. wrote a book in 1907. D.D. said that what B.J. did is steal his book. They weren't real friendly, as you can tell. And finally, he went over and he, he traveled around the country and he came out here to, to Portland. And then he went back again. But this time, B.J. said, no, that's enough. You can't come back. I don't want you. You were here twice. You ruined this place almost. I'm not going to deal with that again. So he wouldn't let D.D. in. And of course, D.D. ultimately then traveled around the country, came back for a homecoming, which they just had here last week in Davenport. Homecomings at that time were fantastic because they had large numbers of people come. They had large numbers of people that were secure in chiropractic and secure in the spirit of chiropractic. And they sort of literally turned the town on fire. And they would parade up and down and, and, and they had great parties and great picnics and great testimonials. And, and they were hearing of people being in jail, still in jail. And that was sort of a badge of courage to go to jail. And so most of those people went to jail for the practice of medicine. Uh, and we've had people in jail as late as 1970 from Louisiana down here. I have with me a, a little film of those of you that read the rag that comes out of Los Angeles, the Chiropractic Inquirer. <laughs> Chap Reaver writes an article in there. His daddy, I have a picture of his daddy, waving to a crowd of people as they came past the workhouse in Ohio and his little hands are waving through the window and they came down to bring him presents for his birthday while he was in jail. And he had a larger crowd come down to visit him in jail than some of us have coming to visit us weekly. And it's an amazing thing for a man to have, for anyone to have been able to teach and have a feeling and a response from his people to the degree that they would go to jail. Ultimately, he had, they had to open the jails up. He was in there for six months and he was adjusting the people in the jailhouse. So people want chiropractic. There's no doubt about it. You see, in those days, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about some of what I've told you. We're talking about the history of chiropractic wherein people did not know anything about insurance, they didn't know anything about orthopedics, neurology, they didn't know anything about anything other than they knew that they were pressing on something and something was happening. And the fact is that we had some very crude individuals out here called chiropractors that maybe last week were butchers and today decided to be a chiropractor because there was no licensing, there was nothing, you could do whatever you wanted to do. And they talked to us and, 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 and a point that I was going to bring before that I lost was that in my travels throughout the United States, it's always brought up to me by somebody that chiropractic, straight chiropractic, that is the adjustment of the spine by hand for the purpose of releasing the mental impulse, period, is horse and buggy carriage type chiropractic, that it's antique, that it has no value. Now my answer to that is this, that in years and years and years before the discovery of chiropractic. Before 1895, as many as 5,000 years ago, people were seeking the spine. Hippocrates spoke about the spine. The American Indian used bull scrotum filled with, with peas to beat out the evil spirits, but they only beat on the spine. That there were crude methods of practicing chiropractic years previous to 1895. However, always man has 
done something to treat somebody's symptom or disease by giving a lotion, a potion, a pill, cut something off, do something from the outside in. They've always done that. And then in 1895, along came a man called D.D. Palmer who said that he has come into the new age. This is a new age kind of health, that we don't put anything in the body, we don't take anything out of the body, we put nothing on it, we treat no symptoms, we treat no diseases, we simply find that area that is disturbing the spirit of man, and we rack the skeletal system to unite man the physical and man the spiritual, and thereby that power can heal all diseases of all kinds and all men. That's a new age thinking. To stop thinking about putting things in, taking things out, cutting things off, and stop doing things from the outside in, that's the antique type thing. So when we came in in 1895, we were then new age. And we remain new age for a period of time until now we have a tendency to go back to horse and buggy type things and where we're doing things from the outside in once again in the name of chiropractic. That we're doing things to stimulate or inhibit the function of the body. In Florida, they're using drugs that we were a drugless profession, we're now not that. Because in Florida we can give drugs. Going back, going back to that which never worked. Why in fact did chiropractic come along? Why did chiropractic respond? Why did chiropractic go through all the jails and all the suppression that it went through and still survive if it wasn't right? And why did people back in the old days and back in his life, not the old days, shoot, I'm not that old. In my days of practice, people came in with blind eyes, sick livers. People were dying and coming in and receiving a chiropractic adjustment and living. Now, what changed? What's happened? And that's my thesis for today. I want to know what has happened to chiropractic. Today, I find myself in McKinney, Texas. I came here for a four-day mastermind session to put the finishing touches on Sigafoos.com site and to plan our launch event. While being here, I thought I would take the time to share a clip with my friend Chris Burfield and to see what he gets from Dr. Sigafoos's talk. As usual, Dr. Sigafoos delivers an incredible performance. Sigafoos at Red Deer is a four-audio set covering five hours of chiropractic history, principle, and philosophy. The clip that you just listened to is approximately 22 minutes of Dr. Sig covering the history of chiropractic's amazing birth. Throughout this clip, Dr. Sigafoos touches on chiropractic hospitals, chiropractic's two times better results with the clinically insane than the medical model, Dee Dee Palmer's humble start and the use of magnetic healing, the positive and negative poles of energy in magnetic healing, Dee Dee's desire to learn uh, and, and, and his quest to understand the whole body and the forces directing it, how his first patient, Harvey Lillard, got his hearing back, and how most of his patients, if not all, were for a variety of visceral disorders and illnesses, how at that time many chiropractors went to jail for practicing quote-unquote medicine without a license, and how the first chiropractors were incredibly crude practitioners, but that chiropractic or something similar was being practiced as far back as Socrates and as well as being practiced by the American Indians. But it ends up with Didi bringing in the concept of not just man the physical, but also man the spiritual. In the end of this clip, we leave off with Dr. Sigafus saying, what has changed? What has happened to chiropractic? As per usual, I never seem to get it very far into, the, into these clips for the simple fact that there's way too much to discuss for a 20 to 40 minute podcast. And with that, I'd actually like to, to introduce my, my second guest, Chris Burfield of Market from the Heart and from Chiropractic Underground, and start off with the big loaded question. What did you get from this clip, Chris? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Carey, thank you for having me on. I'm absolutely honored uh, to be here with you. You know, it's... Uh, um, means a lot to me that you flew all the way from Maryland to Texas to be here. Um, but uh, yeah, to answer your question, you know, one of the things I want to start with is your dad posed a question at the very end, which said, what has happened to chiropractic? And I really truly believe that two things. One, we've lost our sense of philosophy. And first of all, I'm not a chiropractor. 
Um, although I do feel like it at times uh, because I have such a passion and love for chiropractic, um, even though I can't actually adjust people. But uh, I think chiropractic has lost a sense of its philosophy, which really has what makes it unique. And part of that philosophy is connecting man the spiritual with man the physical. And I believe that chiropractic over the last uh, several decades has um, diluted itself down to where it's become mainly about treating man the physical, you know, and leaving out that essential element of, of spiritual. And I'm not talking about making chiropractic or religion or anything like that. You know, I'm talking about, you know, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience and chiropractic allows people to fully express themselves, um, uh, fu really truly fully express the, uh, uh, the, the spiritual aspect of themselves through this, this lump of clay that we call a human body. So I think that's part of the, part of the problem with, uh, with chiropractic uh, and what's happened to it. The second part is I think that there are a lot of people in this profession that have a sense of entitlement. So they go to school, they come out, and they think just because they have some sort of, you know, they have some letters after their name and they can now be called doctor, that, you know, the masses are going to flock to them. And that's simply not the case. And from a marketing standpoint, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's practice suicide to hmm. think like that that's, that you're just going to come out and hang up a shingle and people are going to flock to you. And even worse than that are people that come out, in my, in my opinion, is people that come out and open up a practice and then expect everything to be done for them. And they don't take any real ownership in their practice and spreading the chiropractic message um, and getting out into the community and building personal relationships with people in their community so that they become the doctor that everybody knows, likes, and trusts. So I think there's that sense of entitlement that mm. like... Uh, I'm going to be successful just because I'm a chiropractor. I think that's hurting the profession as well. <laughs> I'd have to say I actually was one of those entitled uh, graduates of chiropractic. Oh, I, you were. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, I, I came you out. You were of, one of those guys. Yes. I came out, you know, and I opened up my office and I, you know, I just expected everybody would come in and, well, while I did succeed, I didn't succeed for very long because I didn't further, well, one, I, di I, 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 I didn't talk the talk of chiropractic philosophy, you know, I, I talk the talk of chiropractic insurance, <laughs> mm -hmm, right? And I, I paid the price in the end with that, uh, not just the price of, of not enjoying what I was doing anymore, but not doing what I was meant to do, which was to educate my, my people on chiropractic. Um, but I digress a bit. I'm going to jump back in here to a few of my bullet points, if you don't mind, yeah, for a second. For it. In, in, in this clip that Dr. Sigapis talks about, he covers some really amazing stuff, and I'm going to hit a couple of them. One is the chiropractic hospitals, and two is the chiropractic's two times better results with the clinically insane than the medical model. What's your take on that? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, I knew, uh, I know a little bit about chiropractic history. I'm by no means an expert in it, but I knew that at one point in time there were chiropractic, like, insane asylums, you know, where. Um, <laughs> It's people. called the Sigafoos household. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, right? I'm kidding. Yeah. Or the Burfield, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so I knew that chiropractic had some really great results with people that were, you know, mentally ill. I had no idea it was, what, two and a half times better results than, uh, than uh, what the, the med medical, medical model, model was yeah. getting. I mean, that absolutely blows my mind. And it kind of makes you wonder, like, well, what happened to that? You know, like, why. You know what was the re? I mean, if it's got if it got better results, why are there no chiropractic asylums? Well, Doctor Sigafoos touched on that, and he said that the that the medical doctors blocked us from doing it. They required us to go back and become medical doctors if we wanted to treat patients as medical patients instead of, you know, hey, we find it and adjust. You know, we find subluxations, we adjust subluxations. That that's it. But we get incredible results, and that wasn't a good enough answer for them. Right. So I think that's, at least that's my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, uh, and, but yeah, going back to that, um, the, uh, 
What was the, uh, remind me what the first part of that was. There was a chiropractic hospitals and the chiropractic two times better results. But Oh yeah, the chiropractic hospitals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is such a cool concept as, as well. And uh, there was what, at one point in time, 38? 38, he said. And right now there's one, the Kale Clinic in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Yeah, you know, it's like, and that's a, I in, would envision like a chiropractic hospital not just being, of you know, I think chiropractic, a lot of chiropractors, they teach the back pain model, mm, yeah. which it's not about that. It never was about that. It's a great side effect. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. exactly. Um, but with the chiropractic hospital, I could see that as being not just a place where people go with, you know, cancer or heart disease or other visceral problems, mm -hmm. but also um, taking a different approach to it and having more of a, of a wellness model with it. My, yeah. fa my family and I have been getting adjusted um, I've been married now, it'll be 10 years this July, and uh, my wife and I, uh, she uh, had never been adjusted before until she started, um, until she married me and started getting adjusted. My daughter is eight years old. She's been adjusted since birth every week. We go every week to the chiropractor and we don't have, we don't have problems. We don't have health issues. I know thousands of chiropractors that also live their life by this chiropractic model and very, very few of them have unhealthy children, unhealthy families. Yeah. So, I mean, I could see these chiropractic hospitals if we had them today being something where people go to, not just for because they have a, a sickness or a disease, mm -hmm. but because they're, they're wanting to be well. And just as here in McKinney, Texas, there are thousands of visits to the, yeah. to the hospital every day. Um, why couldn't that be the same as a, 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 for yeah, chiropractic? A better quality of life. Yeah. As per se. That's a great segue because... You know, one of the other uh, bullet points I got here from what my father was talking about was Didi's first patient was Harvey Lillard. Exactly. And his desire was to, hey, I found the, the cure for, for hearing loss. So he kept on trying to get people to come in and, and nobody else got the same results as, as Harvey did. But the patients that were coming in were having, you know, issues with a veritable plethora of other uh, uh, of visceral disorders and illnesses clear up heart disease, you know, breathing problems, allergies, many different things. So, you know, it goes back to that whole concept of the chiropractic hospital or, you know, treating the body as a whole and, and not just the man, the physical, but man, the spiritual, you right. know, learning what chiropractic is, what innate does, what universal law does and how it applies to chiropractic as a whole. And if we let that go, like you said earlier, you know, we're no different than a physical therapist or an osteopath or, or, or yeah, orthopedist or anything it's like that. It's the philosophy that makes chiropractic unique. And those of you that are listening, I know you've probably, you know, heard that before and some of you have probably never heard it. But chiro the chiropractic philosophy is what makes chiropractic so unique. And um, by, you know, once once you give up the philosophy, you're, you're no different than, than a physical therapist Man. or a medical doctor that can manipulate, you know. Um, I think it's very crucial to chiropractic's future success and uh, not just preserving chiropractic, but allowing chiropractic to thrive again. Yeah. Well, n normally I, I usually just wrap up the show after I give my little breakup of everything, but because I have you here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to gonna stretch it out a little bit and, and ask, is there an ethical marriage between a philosophically sound chiropractor and a marketer. Oh, absolutely. And I, yeah, and this is, you know, marketing has become like, it's like a bad word. You know, people are like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't do marketing. I don't do advertising. You know, BJ Palmer even said, he's like, early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. You know, it was all about, you know, you have to market yourself to get the message out there. What did he say about advertising? Oh, uh, as far as if you fail to advertise oh if you fail to advertise then you'll be advertising with the sale of your office the sale of your yeah, office yeah, yes yeah, yeah. yeah very very true and yeah i mean here's the thing you've got to get this chiropractic philosophy out into your community if you don't get it out into the community then you never change the way the public views health ne never i keep hitting the table with my hands and carrie keeps Isha uh, telling me to wave my hand and he's like stop hitting the table so I get kind of excited sometimes um, but yeah it's like you've got it you've got to teach duplication 
You've got to educate your patients and educate your community about what chiropractic really is, but not just educate them, but also teach them how to educate others. Yeah. And this is where the duplication comes in. And this is one of the reasons why I love podcasting. Yeah. It's such a powerful way. I mean, think about it right now, Doc. You're sitting there, you're listening to SIG Talks, and you just listen to, would you play a 20-minute clip there? 22 minutes. 22 yeah. minutes of Dr. Sigafoos at Red Deer. You're now listening to me and Carrie. The human voice is 60 times more powerful than the, than the written word. And this is the one, reason, one of the reasons why I started Market from the Heart, which is my podcast. Because I, after talking to Dr. Ed Osborne, uh, Osborne, <laughs> I always want to say Osborne, right. it's Osborne, uh, talking to Dr. Ed Osborne, um, he told me, he was like, look, man, you know, you, you've got this blog and you're putting your message out there and people are reading it, but the human voice is 60 times more powerful than the written word. Mm. Why are you not, why aren't you podcasting? Yeah. And when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, why, why am I not? Why, why am I not podcasting? Yeah. So I decided to start Market from the Heart and there's no reason why chiropractors in their community couldn't do the same thing and broadcast their voice across their community, across their city, across their state, across the nation, across the freaking world and make a huge impact on this globe and change public perception of what health and wellness is and what chiropractic is for the betterment of humanity. I mean, if you're not podcasting, I'm sorry, but you're missing the boat and mm. you're doing a disservice to your community. You're doing a disservice to the world. You have a message to share and you and podcasting is one of the absolute yeah. most powerful ways to share it. That's, that's why I love your, that's why I love your show so much. I listen oh, to your, you. every episode. Thank you. It's, it's powerful. It gets yeah. me pumped up. I listen, I listen to you talk. I listen to your dad talk and I'm just like, yeah, you know, this is what, this is what it's all about. Yeah. I, well, I started it just to further my father's teachings, and and I, if I never reach another person, I've already done more than I ever thought I would do. Which is, you know, thanks to you, thanks to Ed Osborne, um, and thanks to my father, Dr. Jim Segafus. So yeah. But um, with that, I would like to say, listen to Market from the Heart weekly, and sometimes bi-weekly, and sometimes tri-weekly. He's constantly one or two episodes ahead of me, which is killing me. <laughs> uh, we will be back again, same bat channel, same bat station next week with another episode. And with that, I'd like to say, if you are interested in, in getting the entire uh, uh, series of Sigafoos at Red Deer, it will be available on Sigafoos.com. Website coming up soon, correct? Yes, it'll be uh, be released uh, sometime soon. Uh, I know we have. Um, I'm not exactly sure when you're going to release this podcast mm -hmm. episode, but it should be. Uh, yeah, it should be coming up here in the next couple of months. Okay, well, uh, keep an eye out, and if you would like to be informed as to when that site or our <laughs> site sigafoos.com goes live, just go to sigafoos.com, and on the landing page, you will see a space for you to put your name and your email address and. We will contact you, not just with when the site starts, but, you know, we do a lot of research and we are probably on our computers 12 to 14 hours a day, weeding through all the good stuff and bad stuff. And, and, and you know, we'll send you lots of information on, on what we find and what we think is good and what you should just pass by. Yeah, all those things that will help you just grow your practice. You know, one of the things that Dr. Carey does as well is he emails the list and lets them know when a new episode of SIG Talks has been released. Yes. So uh, you need to uh, go there, sigafoos.com, opt in and get notified of all this amazing content that is being released. And with that, I would like to say, we're going to do a dual one this time. My tagline, remember to give, love, and do, and serve. And mark it from the heart. Yeah, with Chris Burfield. <laughs> so, that's, you put I, me on the spot, man. Uh, what am I supposed to say? It's our feeble tip to give, love, do, serve from the heart. There, there we go. There that's we what go. I was hoping you'd do. Uh, yeah, all right. So, uh, thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. If you're interested in more of Dr. Sigafoos' material, head on over for your daily dose of chiropractic philosophy to www.sigafoos.com and register for our free newsletter and to find today's audio clip of Dr. Sigafoos in its entirety. Remember to give, love, do, and serve.